Hello, it's Mr. G again. Um, going to do a lecture on measuring vital signs based on chapter 29. You do not have to read the text. Um, I'm basically going over this so that you have the theory when we go over vital signs in class. All right. Uh, so vital signs uh, reflect the function of three body processes essential for life. Uh, basically, the regulation of temperature, um, breathing, and heart function. Uh, vital signs measurements of body function are generally considered temperature, pulse, respirations, blood pressure, and in some facilities, pulse oximetry is c considered part of vital signs. There are also some facilities that will include pain as a vital sign as well. Uh, so you need to find out in whatever facility you work whether um, what the vital signs are for when they ask you to do vital signs, what are they considering uh, the measurements that you have to record. So a person's vital signs can vary with certain limits, and so therefore it's important that you know the limits, um, and we will go over the limits with each of them. I will let you know what in this uh, lecture you need to write for notes, okay? Uh, basically, some of this is going to be introductory stuff, um, um, and some of it will be reviewed from your other um, health science classes, but you don't need to write all of these notes, okay? So vital signs are measured to detect changes in normal body function. Um, they tell you about temperature uh, treatment response um, based on like one indication would be like pain. Sometimes pain will bring blood pressure and heart rate up. And after you've given the treatment, you can tell uh, after the nurse has given the treatment, you can tell because both the blood pressure and the pulse uh, hopefully have responded. Um, often uh, they signal life-threatening events, and that's probably the biggest reason why we want to maintain and monitor vital signs. Um, they are part of the assessment step in the nursing process. So remember, the nursing process includes um, assessment, plan, intervention, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yes, it's ass assessment, plan, intervention, and evaluation. Those are the steps of the nursing process, so assessment is a very important part of that. Uh, vital signs are measured during physical exams when the person is admitted to a healthcare facility um, as often as the condition requires. Sometimes you have to change the frequency of vital signs based on the patient's condition. Uh, before and after surgery or complex procedures or certain diagnostic tests, uh, vital signs will be ordered. Um, and after surgery, the frequency can go from every 15 minutes to every half hour, to every hour, to every two hours, to every four hours. So there's a time frame after surgery where vital signs are taken very frequently, very frequently, and that's to make sure that the patient is recovering from surgery without any vital sign problems. Uh, after some care measures, such as ambulating, um, you may want to take vital signs to see how they've tolerated ambulation. After a fall or other injury, to make sure that their vital signs were not affected by the fall, in addition to also find out if the, the fall was related to uh, vital signs issues like a drop in pulse rate or a drop in blood pressure as well. Um, many times you'll check vital signs when drugs uh, affect the respiratory or the circulatory system, um, like blood pressure medicines or other medicines that affect the heart rate. Um, many times the nurses will ask you to do blood pressures before they give those medications because they want to make sure that the vital signs are still within a normal range. Also, when the person has complaints such as pain, dizziness, lightheadedness, feeling faint, short of breath, rapid heart rate, not feeling well, chest pain, um, anything like that will warrant taking vital signs to make sure that or to see what uh, the vital signs are doing in relation to this pain. Um, and then as stated at the, on the care plan. So um, depending on the facility uh, and or manner, many times vital signs are only taken once a day. In a hospital, they're frequently taken once a shift, if not every four hours. And then in an intensive care unit, you're doing vital signs sometimes every two, um, one or two hours. And of course, they have continuous monitoring in an intensive care unit, so that's a different story they, where they can monitor things um, on a continuous basis. Vital signs show even minor changes in the person's condition. 
Um, so accuracy is essential when you measure and record and report vital signs because they can make the difference between whether somebody's going to have to have an intervention or not. Um, take vital signs with the person at rest, either lying or sitting, um, unless otherwise ordered. But usually it's assumed that when you uh, see a vital sign that has been recorded that the person was at rest when that vital sign was taken. If not, that needs to be recorded near the, vi the particular vital signs that were taken at that time. Um, and you want to report the following at once. Any vital sign that has changed from a prior measurement significantly. I mean, if it's just minor amounts, then you wouldn't. But if it's a significant change, you want to make sure that you uh, record it. I mean, report it. And vital signs above the norm, above and below the normal ranges. And we will go over that uh, in a few minutes. So let's start with body temperature. Body temperature is the balance between the amount of body uh, uh, of heat produced and the amount lost by the body. Thermometers measure temperature, um, and there's a variety of different kinds of thermometers. Usually the scale is either Fahrenheit or centigrade. Some facilities do use a centigrade scale. Uh, normal temperature for a centigrade scale is 37.0. Whereas for a Fahrenheit scale, it's 98.6. Um, and at this point, you don't need to know the, the calculation to um, go from one to the other. Most places that have centigrade will have a chart that compares centigrade with Fahrenheit. So temperature sites where you would take the temperatures include the mouth, the rectum, the axilla or under the arm, the tympanic membrane, which is the eardrum, uh, or the temporal artery, which is on the forehead. Um, each site has its own normal ranges. Um, and once you work in a facility that uses those particular types of um, temperatures, um, they will tell you what the ranges are for those particular ones. Um, in a menorah manner, they use uh, electronic thermometers um, for uh, that measure just like a standard thermometer it's just electronic but it'll be used in the mouth the rectum or the axilla <clears throat> always report temperatures that are above or below the normal range uh, fever means an elevated body temperature okay so when the body is dealing with an infection one of the things it does is create a lot of heat and that heat um, raises the body temperature and so because of that, uh, an elevated temperature is a sign of some sort of infection or inflammatory process going on. So the types of thermometers that can be used are glass thermometers, which you rarely see anymore, but we will go over what they look like and how to use them. Standard electronic thermometers uh, include tympanic membrane ones or the temporal artery ones. Digital thermometers uh, are like a standard glass thermometer it goes under the tongue or in the axilla or in the rectum. Um, and then disposable oral thermometers. Uh, temperature sensitive tapes, and I'll show you pictures of all of these or pacifier thermometers. I don't have a picture of that, but that's just a thermometer that the baby keeps in its mouth and uh, you can pull it out and get a temperature reading, which is very helpful because um, many kids, uh, infants love uh, a pacifier, so it works out well. It doesn't uh, cause any anxiety in the baby. Taking temperatures, uh, the nurse and the care plan will tell you, oops, uh, the nurse and the care plan will tell you when to take the person's temperature, what site to use, and what thermometer to use. So those are all things that you will either need to talk to the nurse or the care plan about. Okay, so this is a, uh, a, a letter A is a standard digital thermometer, okay? It has probe covers, so you have a metal uh, a metal piece that comes out from the hand piece and you apply a plastic probe cover on it and then that goes either in the mouth uh, or in the axilla. When you're using the rectum, uh, rectal approach, you will use a whole new probe. You, even with the probe cover, you will use a, a different probe altogether and it just detaches from the electronic, I mean the digital um, thermometer and um, um, then you can take a rectal thermometer. This is a tympanic membrane thermometer. It goes into the ear, and we'll show a picture of that in a second. This is a temporal, art, uh, temporal artery thermometer. 
this is another battery operated digital uh, oral axillary or rectal thermometer, although this is uh, an oral one because oral axilla because it has a blue uh, coloring and we'll talk about that in a minute. And this is the pacifier. Oh, I didn't uh, I didn't know if I had a picture of that. So that's the pacifier thermometer. Okay, this is a um, one of the disposable thermometers that you might see. It works on on uh, sensitivity uh, based on um, uh, color, uh, temperature sensitivity uh, of chemicals that are in here. And so as you can see, it turns blue as it uh, registers a temperature. So this would be 98.4. See, everyone has five dots, and so it would be 98.4. This is a, another thermometer you might see. It's just a tape. It's a temperature sensitive tape. It's applied to the forehead and it's usually left there for a long period of time. They frequently will use those in surgery to be able to watch a person's temperature during the entire surgical phase. These are glass thermometers. This is what a glass thermometer looks like. Years ago, it used to be filled with mercury. Now it's filled with a temperature se uh, sensitive liquid that expands as it is heated. And that expansion uh, causes the fluid to go up the column depending on the temperature. Um, as you can see, there's different color ones. The red stemmed ones are rectal. The blue stem ones are oral. Um, as you can see here, we have a Fahrenheit and a uh, Celsius or centigrade um, thermometer. Um, and we will go over a better picture of the gradients of each of the, the measuring um, scales uh, so that you can get familiar with that. Most of the glass thermometers have a uh, plastic sleeve that they go into. So you put the thermometer into the sleeve and then you peel away the paper part of it and that plastic covered uh, thermometer is put into the mouth, the axilla or the rectum. And then after the thermometer, the temperature is taken, the plastic sleeve is removed and thrown away. So this is what I was talking about in terms of the gradient. So if you notice here, we have 96, 98, 99, 100, okay? And in between, we have five increments. So each one is going to be 0.2 temperature. So 98.6 would be the normal temperature for Fahrenheit, and it would be right here, 98.6. This temperature here is 99.8 because we've gone to 99, 99.2, 0.4, 0.6, 0.8, 99.8. So the whole numbers usually have um, either darker or taller gradients and then um, smaller increments in between. This is a centigrade scale. And as you can see, we have 35, 36, 37. 37 is the normal temperature. 37.5 is uh, right about here. So each one in this scale is 0.1. So point, uh, 37.1, 37.2, 37.3, 37.4, 37.5, 37.6, 37.7, 37.8, 37.9, 37.10, 37.11, 37.12, 37.13, 37.14, 37.15, 37.16, 37.17, 37.18, 37.19, 37.20, 
And that usually stays there for three to three to five, sometimes even 10 minutes. Um, and also you want to make sure you don't give somebody, uh, you want to make sure they haven't had something to drink cold within the last 10 to 15 minutes. Um, axillary thermometer goes in the axillary um, area and it has to stay there longer, um, usually up to 10 minutes to get an accurate measurement of the axilla because the axilla is not kept warm all the time. Um, it's more exposed to air than the mouth is, so that's the reason it has to stay longer. A tympanic uh, thermometer goes into the opening of the ear or, or uh, the um, ear canal after you put some upward pressure. Uh, so you pull. This is called the pinna of the ear. Okay, so you just pull up on the pinna and you put the tympanic thermometer in. This is where the thermometer ends. This is the ear canal and this is the tympanic membrane or the ear drum, and that's where it's going to sense the temperature. It's a fairly accurate temperature. Uh, as well as the tympanic, uh, the uh, temporal artery one as well. Okay, so electronic thermometers are commonly used. Some have batteries. Um, others are kept in a battery charger when not in use so that they're always uh, at top uh, battery charge when you uh, go to use them. It's important with that these batteries uh, the ones that have battery chargers that after you're done, you bring the thermometer back to the battery charger, that you don't leave it on a counter because what can happen is the next person goes to use it and it doesn't have enough battery life and they're not going to be very happy with you. So their uh, standard electronic thermometers measure temperature in a few seconds. Uh, they have both oral and rectal probes, as I said earlier. Tympanic membrane thermometers measure temperature in one to three seconds. That's the really nice thing about it because you get such a quick temperature. Um, and they risk the spread of infection um, because um, they, they go right into the ear, which um, is less apt to um, pr promote an infection. They do have covers on the end of the tympanic um, thermometer probe. And then temporal artery thermometers measure uh, temperature in three to four seconds. They measure the temperature of the blood in the temporal artery, which is the sem same temperature of the blood coming from the heart. So once again, a very accurate measurement of the core temperature. Glass thermometers are color coded, as I said, blue for oral and axillary and red for rectal. Glass thermometers are reusable. However, there's a few problems, as you can imagine, with them. One, they take longer to register, three to 10 minutes. They break easily. Um, so when you're flicking the thermometer down, um, as I uh, showed you a picture of earlier, after you're done taking the temperature, um, it, you know, it can hit something and break, um, but it's, it's glass, so it can break easily. And because of that, it can be you know, dangerous when you have an exposed piece of glass um, that you might not have noticed the tip has been broken off. The person may bite down or break on an oral thermometer, which would be terrible. Um, so it's generally, most places don't use them anymore. So now let's talk about the pulse. Uh, the pulse is felt every time the heart, uh, a pulse is felt every time the heart beats. So as that, that ejection of blood um, from the heart makes its way throughout the body, it forms like a fluid wave, uh, just like the wave at a football game, and that is the pulse that you feel uh, when you're feeling an artery. The pulse is the beat of the heart felt at the artery um, as the wave passes through the artery, and it's generally felt at bony areas where the arteries are close to uh, the surface or close to a bony area. And we will go over the pulse points uh, in a few minutes, but they're temporal, carotid, brachial, radial, femoral, popliteal, posterior tibial, which is in the feet, and dorsalis pedis, which is in the feet. Uh, that's why they're called pedal pulses, are on each side of the body. Uh, the radial pulse is the, the, used the most often. So that is the, uh, the pulse measurement that is used the most frequently. Carotid pulse is taken during CPR or other emergencies only because it's easier to obtain and it's closer to the heart. So if the heart is very weak um, and uh, you not able to pump a strong pulse to the extremities, you will still be able to feel uh, a pulse in the carotid pulse. 
the apical pulse is felt over the heart and the apical pulse is usually not felt but listened to with a stethoscope. Um, and we'll go over that in just a second. So a stethoscope is an instrument used to listen to the sounds produced by the heart, the lungs, and other body organs. You don't only use a stethoscope for just the heart and the lungs. You listen block to bowel sounds, but um, for our purposes now, it's just for the heart and the lungs. It's used to take apical uh, pulses and blood pressures. Uh, the device makes sounds louder for easy hearing. Uh, to use a stethoscope, uh, you wipe. You have to wipe the earpieces in the diaphragm with antiseptic wipes before and after use. You place the earpiece tips in your ear, um, and you tap the diaphragm gently to make sure that you um, uh, are getting a good uh, connection with the diaphragm. We will go over the diaphragm and the bell in just a second, the parts of the stethoscope. And then you place the di diaphragm over the pulse site. Um, you want to prevent any noise um, because that, uh, even though the, the uh, diaphragm is right over the uh, artery, you, any uh, exterior noise will interfere with you being able to hear it. So this is a stethoscope here. There's the e pieces, the ear pieces, then there are the two uh, what's called binaurals, okay? So A-U-R-A-L-S has to do with hearing things. So those are the binaurals that um, are metal pieces that attach to the rubber or plastic tubing. And then the rubber or plastic tubing attaches to this apparatus here. Now, not every stethoscope has a bell. They all have a diaphragm, but not all of them have a bell on the chest piece. So whether it has a diaphragm or a diaphragm and a bell, this is called the chest piece, all right? Let's see. The pulse rate is uh, the number of heartbeats that you feel in one minute. Um, the rate varies with each age group. Uh, an adult pulse rate is between 60 to 100 beats per minute, so you want to write that down. And you want to be sure to report any abnormal pulse rates to the nurse at once. Tachycardia, please write that down as well, is a heart rate more than 100. Bradycardia is a heart rate less than 60 beats per minute, and that should also be noted as well. You want to note both the rhythm and the force of the pulse. So the rhythm is the regularity of the pulse, kind of like the beat of a song, okay? Something that comes regular like that. Whereas an irregular pulse might be like this, Okay, that's an irregular pulse. So, or you could have a pulse that has a, an occasional irregularity. Okay, uh, but regularity is one of the things you want to look at. Also, uh, so an irregular pulse occurs when the beats are not evenly spaced. Okay, so one thing you want to record in your notes that a pulse should uh, be recorded for both rhythm and force. I mean, measured for both rhythm and force when you're measuring it. Uh, the force relates to the pulse strength or how strong a pulse is. And you can have a strong pulse, a forceful pulse, a bounding pulse, okay? Uh, those are all descriptions of forceful pulses. Hard to feel pulses are usually described as weak, thready, or feeble. So those are all terms that you will hear. And as you become more comfortable, you'll be able to describe those as well. So you should have everything on this slide in your notes. Electronic blood pressure equipment can also be used to count pulses. Um, when you get the blood pressure measurement on an electronic device, it will have the pulse measurement. Uh, some will show if the pulse is regular or irregular, but many of them will not. So it's important that you also feel the pulse to be able to, uh, be able to report whether it was regular or irregular. And you need to be able to feel it to determine what the, its force is. So using electronic device essentially mean, doesn't mean that you don't have to feel the pulse, okay? You still have to feel uh, the radial pulse. So you'll take pulses either radially, apically, which is at on the chest using a stethoscope, or apically and radially at the same time, um, and we'll talk about that in, the, uh, in a minute. You must accurately count 
um, and you must actually report and record the, the pulse rates that you do re receive and make sure you uh, record what, uh, um, what method you used. So the radial pulse is the most frequently used for vital signs. Uh, you count the pulse for 30 seconds and then multiply by two. Uh, some places will require you to count it for a minute. If the pulse is irregular, whether the facility requires it or not, you should count the pulse for a minute because 30 seconds may not be an accurate measurement. So you want to make sure you have everything on that slide. Okay. <clears throat> These are the pulse sites. So um, as you can see, the temporal arteries are on each side uh, of the head, in the anterior part of the head where the temples are. The carotid pulses are on each side of the neck. The apical pulse is found generally just below the, below the nipple line at the mid-clavicular line. So this is the clavicle. And if you would put a line through this clavicle and right at the nipple line, that would be where the apical pulse is. <clears throat> and it's called apical because that's where the apex or the, the uh, pointed part of the heart is. Um, here are the brachial arteries where you would uh, find the brachial pulse to do a blood pressure measurement. Uh, behind the knee uh, is what's called the popliteal pulse. Um, and then the pedal pulses, even though the book tends to only use dorsalis pedis as a pedal pulse, you can use both the dorsalis pedis and the posterior tibial. The posterior tibial is behind the bony prominence on the medial aspect of the ankle. So you know how there is a bony prominence on each side of your ankle. The medial side or the one toward the middle is called the, um, is where, behind that bone is where the posterior tibial pulse will be found. The radial pulse is found uh, on the thumb side of the arm. Uh, I mean, of the, yeah, of the arm, of the forearm. And it's in a groove between uh, the uh, radial bone and a uh, ligament that um, uh, a uh, flexor tendon that is right near there. There's a little groove there, and that's where you would put your fingers. You use your uh, either your first two or your first three fingers. Um, I shouldn't say the first three because um, the thumb is also considered a finger, but you would use your pointer, your middle finger, and your ring finger. Uh, never use your thumb because your thumb has a pulse. Some people even feel the pointer has a pulse as well. So some people recommend that the, the middle and the ring finger together are the ones you should use, and we'll go over that in class. Uh, the apical pulse is on the left side of the chest, slightly below the nipple. I told you that. It's taken with the stethoscope, counted for a minute, um, and you count each love dub as one beat. Um, so um, you're going to listen and you're going to hear love dub, love dub, love dub, love dub. And so love dub, that is one beat, okay? Um, and we can do some practicing of that in class. Apical pulses are taken on persons who have heart disease, uh, have irregular heart rhythms, uh, or are taking drugs that affect the heart. Um, and generally, the nurse will let you know if it needs to have, if the patient needs to have an apical pulse. Uh, generally, it's the nurse who will do an apical pulse. Uh, many times, uh, uh, nursing assistants uh, are not the ones who will do an apical pulse. This is a diagram here of where you would find the apical pulse. And in terms of what the anatomy looks like, you can see the heart right here. And the tip of the heart is right there. The left ventricle, the main ventricle of the heart is right here. And that's why you listen at that point, because um, that's where the heart is closest to the chest wall. And it's where the left ventricle, which is the pumping ventricle, I, well, they're both pumping ventricles, but the one that pumps blood to the entire body is uh, generally located. And this is how you would hold the the stethoscope against the chest to listen to an apical pulse. Um, you want to make sure that you warm the stethoscope before you apply it to the chest because um, that can be quite chilling for the patient. So um, try as much as you can to warm it up. 
Uh, taking an apical radial pulse is basically just taking an apical pulse with holding the stethoscope with one hand and then bringing your hand down to feel the radial pulse. Sometimes there's a discrepancy between the two because not all of the uh, apical impulses or the pumps of the heart are making their way to a radial pulse. So that's the reason why you would do that. Sometimes early beats or skip beats that the patient has, you'll hear them on apical, but you won't feel them on radial. Um, it says here that two staff members are needed, but there are many nurses who will be able to do an apical radial um, um, alone. Uh, one takes the radial pulse, the other one takes the apical pulse in a two staff member um, ap uh, radial apical measurement. Uh, doing this at the same time is called an apical radial pulse. The pulse deficit is the difference between the apical and the radial pulse rates. And like I said, it's generally because there are skip beats or irregularities in the patient's pulse. To obtain the pulse deficit, you subtract the radial rate from the apical rate, and that will give you your pulse deficit. So um, since this is not done very frequently, I wouldn't take notes on that, but I would have notes on the other slides related to pulse. Uh, checking pedal pulses, um, you should also take notes on this. Um, so the pedal pulses are either the dorsalis pedis or the posterior tibial pulses, and you can refer to that diagram if you're still uh, unsure about that. We will go over that in class to show you where the designation, where the, um, the pulse rates are found. A, a Doppler, which is an ultrasound stethoscope, sometimes is used to find pedal pulses if they cannot be palpated, um, but that's generally something a nurse would do. Your role may include uh, using a, a, a Doppler in some facilities, but make sure you've received the necessary training, that you follow the nurse's directions, and that you have followed the manufacturer instructions. Um, this is where you would find the dorsalis pedis pulse. There is no, I could not find a picture showing where the posterior tibial pulse is, but we'll talk about that in class. Okay, since I've already gone 30 minutes, I will stop at this point and we will finish um, the slide presentation in class. Um, so that will end that and we will see you uh, next class. Thanks for your attention. <clears throat>